I grew up in Berkeley. Um, there was a TV show uh, with the host uh, Art Linkletter, and the theme song had a clarinet in it. And I, I really liked the sound of the clarinet, so I tried to tell my parents that um, my father that I wanted to play that horn, but I didn't know what it was called. It had sort of a oodly oodly sound, so I called it a oodle horn, and. Um, Nobody knew what I was talking about for a couple of years. <laughs> and then in grade school, they came by with all the instruments and they played them for us one at a time. And I, you know, it's that one. That's, that's the song I, I want to play. And so I got my, <clears throat> my folks to rent me a clarinet for a while and you know, proceeded from that. It was, uh, you know, the school music programs back in the day, I don't know if they're like anymore, but back then they were pretty awesome. You could really go a long ways in a school music program. I, um, in junior high school, I had a teacher who could see I was looking for something and she let me take the tenor saxophone home over the summer after eighth grade. And um, it was, that became my livelihood. So I remember being a really little kid and just humming all the time you know just it was like humming was my day in and my day out there were like melodies in my mind and I just felt like uh, I wanted that to be the external part of my existence too was to make music you well know. when you heard the Art Linkletter show what was the guy playing on the oodle horn he, you know of course I can't remember but it was, it was something about um, Something about the timbre of the instrument, something about the fluidity of the sound. Um, I, I, you know, it's really hard when you're young. You don't know exactly why things appeal to you, but they sometimes you'll you'll like. like I like the color maroon. I really like the color. I don't know why. It just appealed to me, and it was the sound of the clarinet just appealed to me. My mother had um, a real big interest in jazz and rhythm and blues. Um, she lived a sort of bohemian existence, and um, those were the soundtrack elements of her life. And mm -hmm. So when I would, my parents split up when I was fairly young, but when I would be at her house, there would always be jazz on the radio, and we would go to barbecues, and they'd play r and I'd hear Ray Charles and that sort of stuff. And My father was never a musician, he was a mathematician, but he felt like classical music was something he should like. So he always had that around. So I had both experiences. Um, I mean, they're, I don't think they're really that opposed in a sense, but they were, um, you know, I had a variety of experiences with music. And I began going to, my mother would take us along to um, poetry readings and to uh, jazz festivals and that sort of thing. So when I was very young, I was going to I saw John Handy play at Stern Grove in San Francisco and when I was maybe eight years old. Are you still playing clarinet at this time? I had started, no, I hadn't started clarinet when I first heard that, you know. That came a little bit later, but I don't think I really thought of myself as being one of those people exactly. I just was aware that they existed. And She married a jazz musician. Um, that really became sort of the, the key moment. She married a guy uh, your, your mom remarried? Uh, remarried, and she married a guy who played uh, jazz trumpet. He was a very, very good player, very good musician. And he would um, encourage me to practice. He would sit at the piano, too, for hours at a time. He wasn't a piano player, but he could play chord progressions. And he would sit at the piano at first, just very simple things. And I would play along, and then he got more and more complicated, and he would he wrote music too, and he'd play his songs, and I'd play with him. And he started bringing me around to his friends, and we would play at jam sessions. He worked at his place called Project Nitty Gritty. This place is in time. It was in the early late late 60s, 68, 69, and it was a neighborhood development project. And uh, I would play with these musicians. My stepfather had spent 13 years of his life in the penitentiary, and he was in a 12-step program moving out of that. And part of his 12-step program was working at Project Nitty Gritty, which was um, an interesting place. And it was full of other ex-convict jazz musicians. There seems to be actually quite a few of these people. And, <laughs> and um, 
um, for whatever reason, you know, drug addicts and the like. And, and, um, and we would play together. And it was um, this sort of transcendent experience of playing with people who were honest to goodness jazz musicians, you know. They may not never have become well known, but they, they understood the music as well as anybody did. And um, I remember the first time it really happened where we were improvising together and I felt like, I felt like, you know what? I can't ever do anything else. This has got to, this is my oh. universe from now on. Um, once you've had that experience, it's very difficult to like imagine yourself not having it over and over again. It's, it's a very rich experience. Um, and it happened to me when I was 13 years old. And so it was, we ended up in a neighborhood, and three doors away was this guy, Bert Wilson, who was an avant-garde saxophone player, and um, avant-garde jazz saxophone player. He, he's, he's, um, he's an interesting man. He had polio when he was very young and lived for a long time in a hospital for little kids with polio. And someone had given him a Charlie Parker record, and this became his inspiration, and he learned every Charlie Parker solo on record on his, uh, first he could whistle them. He could whistle them verbatim right off the record. It was quite amazing. Uh -huh. I, he would do this for me from time to time. But and they gave him a clarinet and he learned that and he wanted a saxophone so they gave him one of those and he needed it to keep his lungs working uh, because he was, it was something they did I guess for polio kids. And this then. is when he was a child? When he was a child and when I met him he was living on a second floor apartment with no elevator in the building and you could hear the music coming out of his apartment like all the time. It was like, you know, as soon as he was awake in the morning, he'd start playing and then he'd have friends over and they'd be playing. And, and one, I just used to stand out in front of it and just listen. And then one day, one of the guys told me, why don't you come upstairs? So I came upstairs and I met Bert, and Bert Wilson's his name. And um, uh, we, we got to be friends and I, he let me come over whenever I wanted. So I came over like every day if I could. And, I would carry him downstairs and he had two wheelchairs and I'd put him in his other wheelchair so we could roll around in the garden because otherwise he was stuck upstairs in his apartment. And, and it ran errands for him and stuff, but mostly just, you know, listened to records and played with them and people would come over to play and I'd play with them too. It was, it was just an, an accidental occurrence, you know, who knew that was... Well, it was kind of tough for like a 13-year-old, 14-year-old white kid to like break into the jazz business, you know, it was like not an automatic thing, you know. I just didn't look the part, um, I, and it was not an it was not an easy thing to do. But I had, I listened to Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin and all that other stuff that my peer group listened to, and got in bands with kids playing that music early on. And then I got interested in the R and B, which I'd listened to all my life, and got into bands playing that with, um, you know with other people, so, and it was an automatic way to make a living. We were playing fraternity parties and, and dances, and we'd play at um, um, bowling alleys and what have you, you know, whatever you could find. We had, we got jobs, and <clears throat> my mom sort of picked up and left when I was 16, and I needed to make a living, so I was not gonna do something like, like figure out, like, you know, how do I get a jazz gig? Well, first of all, you can't make any money playing jazz anyhow most of the time. That didn't make any sense. And I needed, I needed to make like a living right away. So um, I got into like the most, the busiest working groups that would hire a 16 year old at the time and did that. I played in a group called James Levi and the Funk Machine, which was an R&B outfit. We played um, James Brown tunes and stuff like that. And a lot of different kinds of groups like that. And, it was fun. It was a, I really enjoyed it because we, we, you know, you're playing for people dancing, you're playing for, you know, your peer group sometimes. It was, it was pretty exciting. It was oh. interesting. And then Tower of Power called me out of nowhere uh, and said, would you come out and play on the road with us? And I, I, I thought my ship had come in. But hadn't you uh, been hanging well, out Well, I guys? knew those guys. They, they, they knew my, my um, they knew Bert. And also, I had played, we had opened for them at some of the bars we played at, so they, they knew who I was. I was this, I was, all I did was practice. I, I would practice every day for six or seven or eight hours a day, and I got kind of like notorious for being this kid that played a saxophone all the time, you know.
know, I was just like a, 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 an entity. I was really unconventional. And I think they hired me mostly because I was just so odd. <laughs> you know, I was just like such an, a strange, you know, entity in the world, you know. And they just, uh, and I could play these crazy high notes and I could do this dance and they liked it and they thought, well, we'll hire him, you know.